Church, don't hold back anything that you can surrender to the Lord in this moment. Surrender it all. Don't hold on to anything. Don't hold on to your fears, your failures, your worry, your doubt. Don't hold on to your treasure, your blessings, your gratitude, your grace. Let it all go, let it all flow to the Savior who is worthy of our worship. From eastern lands they came, from an ancient people they came, with great authority they came, bearing gifts of great value and worth they came, to his feet they came, and they surrendered all. Those wise men of old, the ancient magi, and like them, you and I, today, we come to the feet of the Christ and give it all to the King. All of our treasure, whatever it's worth, all of our lack, whatever we need, all of our worship, holy and pure, all of our failure, so weak, all of our faith, all of our hope, all of our heart given to him. And Christ the King says to you today, I receive you. I receive your worship. I receive your life. Now believe. Believe in my touch, my healing touch, my helping touch, my purifying touch, my reconciling touch my reviving touch because I, the Lord your God, will lead you. In the night, I will lead you. In the dark, I will lead you. In your hurt, in your need, in your pain, I will help you. I will heal you. That's the word of the Lord Jesus Christ to you and I today and every day, any day that anyone will surrender all to him, they will find that all he has and all he is is given back to them and more. Not more in the sense that there is any more than him, but more in the sense that there is no end to him and there is no end to his love. Lord, let your love envelop us today. Not just because we are gluttons for grace, although if there was ever anything to be gluttonous for, it would be you. But you, you don't produce gluttons. What you produce is faithful worshipers. But Lord, we ask that you would envelop us in your love so that we could show your love to others and live in the light of your love. And we thank you for the forgiveness of our sins, for the acceptance of our lives, for the mission of your kingdom, and for the eternal promise of hope. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus, amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What a good way to begin a day. Amen. Thank you so much to our excellent worship team. Boy, I'm so blessed by all of you. Very good job. Really appreciate that. There's such a sincere heart in their worship, and it leads me into the throne room of the Lord. Thank you for you being a part of this time of worship. For those of you that are streaming live with us, or if you're watching this recording at a later point, we are so grateful that you are part of PCF today. I'm Pastor Courtney Hall, for any guests who may not recognize me, and I am the lead pastor of Praise Christian Fellowship, and I welcome you this morning. Good morning to you all, or whatever time of day it is where you are or when you are watching. May the Lord's grace and peace be with you. It is the third Sunday of Advent here at PCF on this uh, Sunday, December 13th of 2020, and we are excited and grateful to go forward in our time of preparation for this holy day, this wonderful holiday of Christmas that is coming. Before we get to today's preaching, I just want to share a few messages with you about what's coming up and what's going on. Allow me to take a quick refresher here. So we are continuing with our regular Sunday services, and we want to make a point of emphasizing that fact 
uh, because obviously there is a great deal going on, especially here in LA County. We uh, are well aware that there is unfortunately this uh, very uh, critical increase in COVID cases. Uh, we've now reached over half a million cases in LA County. So we continue to ask the Lord to enable us to carry on victorious in destiny. That's our COVID call, carry on victorious in destiny. I've asked you to say it before, but why not just repeat it right now? Will you say it after me? Say it right where you are. Say it if there's someone around you or just say it to the Lord, that in Jesus, I will carry on victorious in destiny. That's our call. So we are aware of uh, the conditions. We are aware of the facts, but we are not living in fear of that. And yet we want to act wisely. Our priority in this season is that we continue to move forward with our harvest purpose according to the will and the call of the Lord, and particularly that we would not forsake the assembling together. Whether it's online or on our patio, our priority is to maintain our regular uh, sessions of worship. And so in this season, we are confident that we are able to do that in a way that is safe and reasonable and responsible, and it is aligned with our, uh, our current mandate from county officials and so forth. All of that is to say, every Saturday we are continuing to have our Tagalog service at 9 a.m. Saturday on the patio, masked, distanced, um, outdoors. Um, we do take temperatures. Every Sunday from 8.30 to 9.30 a.m. we have our worship service, a full church service in that hour or so, on the patio, and uh, we worship the Lord, we receive tithes and offerings, once a month we take communion there, and there is a, a version of the sermon that is brought during that time. So we will continue that next Sunday and for every foreseeable Sunday uh, uh, as the Lord enables us until we are able to uh, completely restore indoor worship, which we are believing for uh, at some point in the future, and we believe that our prayers can help advance towards that. Now, we had announced that we would be having some other gatherings during this Christmas season. And we are saying today, after uh, having met with the pastoral team yesterday, and we reviewed this together, we feel it would be wise not to do that at this time. So we will maintain our Sunday services, but we are not going to have a uh, Christmas party or gathering following service next Sunday. That's not going to happen. We've decided to cancel that just out of precaution and safety. Uh, we want all of you to be well. And so we will have service 8.30 a.m. on the patio next Sunday. We will have our 10 a.m. online. We will not have a gathering after that. We will update the website and the other information to reflect that, the bulletins and so forth. But that is a change, and we wanted to make you aware of that. Also, we are not going to have any physical gathering on Christmas Eve, but we are going to have a Christmas Eve service. So let me just repeat that in case you missed it. We have a Christmas Eve service online only, 6 p.m., online on Thursday, December 24th, 6 p.m. Pacific, Thursday, December 24th, Christmas Eve. We will stream an online service just as we do on Sunday mornings, just as we did uh, the night before Thanksgiving. So the night before Christmas, we will do that. But online only, we will not have an in-person gathering. By the way, that service will be recorded. So if you're not able to stream live with us at 6 p.m. Pacific on December 24th, you can still uh, capture the, uh, or, or view, that is to say, the recording through our YouTube page and come to the website and you can see that later. But we are excited about that opportunity to gather and worship. We believe it's important. Uh, and that'll just be an hour. Uh, it'll be a relatively short service, uh, but it'll be an opportunity to consecrate the evening as we prepare for Christmas Day. So that's what's coming up. Now, this Wednesday, we will have, as we usually do, our Zoom prayer meeting. So this Wednesday uh, upcoming is our Zoom prayer meeting. Uh, I believe that is the uh, 16th, if I'm not mistaken. I hope that's correct. Um, and uh, that's at 7 p.m. Pacific. That will be our last Wednesday Zoom prayer for this calendar year. So that's the last time that we'll have a Wednesday Zoom meeting, this coming Wednesday. And then we will have two weeks off. Of course, we have the Christmas Eve service that will be streaming on live the following week. And then the week of New Year's, we, we will not have a midweek gathering. We will resume our Zoom prayer meetings uh, after this week. We will resume again the first Wednesday in January, which I believe is January 6th. And that, uh, that will be the beginning of our 2021 um, prayer meetings. We are anticipating that this is a pattern that we will continue for uh, into January. We will be watching how things progress. We're praying and believing uh, for uh, a restoration of in-person 
gatherings in our normal form to come. Uh, but at this point, we'll keep you posted and just keep praying. I want to say something about the season as we carry on Victorious and Destiny. There is the potential for any one of us to get discouraged based on what's going on around us right now. Not just COVID, but also all kinds of crises in our, in our society and perhaps in our lives. If you're a business owner, if you're out of work, if you are working in the healthcare industry, if you're a teacher, if your office is uh, working remotely, whereas you used to go in and work in person, if you're still going in and working in person and you're feeling isolated or alienated because of that, um, and the demand of that, whatever the situation is, if you're a student and you're trying to adapt to a totally online learning experience or you're missing out on some of your sporting activities or social activities, whatever your circumstance is right now, if you're very distressed about things at home or things abroad, you're probably feeling the challenge of maintaining the attitude of joy in a season that is supposed to be all about joy the Christmas season. That's part of why we are taking the focus that we are. That's part of why we have this Advent expectation, uh, because it helps us to hold on to hope and to prepare for something bright and beautiful coming, even in the midst of darkened times. And so I'm, I'm going to just uh, ask the guys in the booth here if my slides are coming up, because I don't see them yet, so I don't know if that means they're ready or not, but I'm ready to move into them if you're ready to bring them up. Thank you very much, Carl. God bless you, brother. So I, I mentioned this to say, I mentioned what I'm saying about the purpose of Advent, to call you and I to a place of hope, of peace, of joy and expectation right now. And to remind you, COVID can't cancel Christmas. Amen? COVID can't cancel Christmas. No crisis can cancel Christmas. That's not to say that we're living with our heads in the, stand, in the sand like ostriches. It's not to say that we're uh, putting on rose-colored glasses to such a degree that we're just ignoring the reality of the world around us. But rather, it's saying that we are going to look at everything, not just through our natural eyes, but through the spirit of faith, with a pure expectation of hope and confidence in God. The Christmas story, if it tells us anything, it tells us that people who are living in troubled times and trying circumstances, and yet who still believe, will receive something beautiful from the Lord as they wait expectantly with faith. That's the promise of God. And it's not an empty promise. It's full. It's as full as that stable in Bethlehem. It's as full as the heart of the Lord. It overflows with real joy, real hope, and real strength in the midst of trying times. I saw that old familiar Christmas story about the Grinch who stole Christmas. I saw that again this week. I always loved that when I was a kid, and I must say I, I still enjoy the story very much. And I'm sure it's no spoiler at this point because anybody uh, who's lived through one Christmas has probably had opportunity already to see The Grinch Who Stole Christmas. But you know that what happens is there's a change inside of The Grinch. There's a change inside of his heart. His little shrunken, shriveled little prune of a heart grows when he realizes that Christmas can't be stolen, that even if the trees were taken away and all the ornaments and decorations, even if each light and candle were snuffed out, even if all the tinsel and trappings and wrappings and boxes and bags were pulled away and all of the food and the feasting and the fellowship of all of those parties were wiped away, and every gift from under the tree taken up to the top of a mountain and ready to be dumped off. Christmas does not reside in all of those things. It resides in your heart and in the heart of the Lord. And it can't be taken away. It can't be stolen. It can't be conquered. It can't be snuffed out. It is the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. But the reality is when that light is shining, all those other things shine with it and brighter. They're reflections of that real light. The lights on your tree, the candles on your table, the gifts of your giving, 
They reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they do, it's like, it's like a mirror ball, right, in the dance hall. The light shines on it, and it sends out that glittering beauty all over your life and all over the world. And the right response to that is to worship the Lord for his goodness. The pure promise of a pure God whose holiness comes to you and I in our unholiness to make us clean and to give us hope and life. Today we're going to focus on the gift of frankincense. It is incense. You hear it right there in the name. It is a component of worship. And today we are going to talk about lifting our worship before the Lord. As you lift your worship to the Lord, as you bow at his feet, as you surrender all unto him, there is in you a lifting that will come, an encouragement, a, an equipping of God's grace. As we come to his word, let's pray to the Lord, because whenever we read the word and consider what it says, we want to do so in the light of his guidance and in the spirit that is God. Lord, we thank you that your word is your light in our life. It shines brightly, no matter the darkness. We pray that as we open your word and receive from you today, you would guide us in our understanding, help us in our application, and lead us in our living. To the glory of your name, amen. We've talked about how productive the promise of God is. We've talked about how when you and I receive the word of God, like a seed, the word of God, a seed sown into our heart, there is faith that produces bounty out of that. There's multiplying productivity that makes God's promise plentiful in your life and mine. And now I want to focus this week on the purity of that promise because it's not just that God is doing something and that something is multiplying, but that something that multiplies is also integrated. It is pure, holy, powerful, strong. In our worship, we experience the purity of God. In fact, the reason why incense was part of worship in the ancient world, well, there, there's manifold reasons that we'll talk about today, but one of them was to cleanse the air. Remember that the tabernacle and later the temple that God decreed for his people to make, which was reflective of the throne of God and the throne room of God, the heavenly order of his kingdom, the spiritual order of his kingdom, reflected in the symbols and the activity of the priestly worship that was carried out in the temple. Remember that that involved animal sacrifice. And when you have that, you have not only the butchering of animals and the processing of the, uh, of the carcass and so forth, but then you also have the burnt element of that. There would be boiling and burning of meats and, and animal product. And that obviously creates some powerful smells. If you've ever been uh, to the butcher's shop, you know uh, what I'm talking about. And there were other uh, elements also involved in the baking and with uh, other uh, fires that were burning. So there was a need to cleanse the air and to create an atmosphere that was perfumed and lovely. The notion of incense, in part, was to make a pleasing smell for God. But also, you probably have, I mean, I know that uh, Sister Harris is watching this, uh, streaming with us, and uh, will appreciate this fact. She loves those candles that you can light all over the house, and they're so fragrant, and they fill that house with a wonderful smell. Now, you like to do that in your home, and God likes that in his too, right? But really, it's a symbol because we recognize that God, who is a living spirit, is not coming around with a human nose sniffing around uh, into the temple. But what it's really describing is what pleases the Lord, what is a perfume in his sensibility, in his spirit, is when you and I are worshiping in a pure way. So that incense that went up, it created an atmosphere where you can smell that it's good. You can see that it's good. The smoke rising up is also a visualization of a spiritual reality. As tactile, material things are transformed 
you know, from meat on the altar into smoke in the air, or the grain offering that was burned is turned from grain that has been produced plentifully out of the field. Now it is purified into the atmosphere. It goes into a spiritual realm, as it were. At least that's the visual symbol that that smoke represents, is a transition from physical into spiritual, or really better to say an integration The spiritual is being recognized and acknowledged in the natural realm, the physical realm. And the purity of the spirit is being imparted in the natural realm. The purity of God's spirit communicating to us as we lift up the incense of worship to him. So that's our focus for today. I want to step back and kind of put this into the context more broadly of the advent that we've been talking about. For any who are joining us today, a guest, or you're just uh, starting into the series with us, let me review a few points with you. Advent is the traditional period that is observed in the four Sundays leading up to Christmas that is really about a spiritual focus of anticipation. It focuses us on the coming of Christ, both in the historical fashion, that is to say we recognize that a Messiah was promised, and there was a long period of waiting, and then that Messiah came, and he was born as Jesus of Nazareth to Mary the Virgin and her husband Joseph. But he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He lived, died, rose again, ascended to the Father, is enthroned in heaven, and has promised to come back. So that's the second part of our expectation. In fact, the fact that Jesus was promised before and came is part of the promise we have now that he will come again. So every Advent, we not only celebrate the fact that Jesus has come, But we also remind ourselves that Jesus is still coming to return and complete the fullness of all things. And that helps us to hold on with faith in a hopeful manner in the midst of Advent. He was and is a savior for all people. Though he was born a Jewish man to the Jewish uh, traditions and he is the Jewish savior, that Jewish savior, the Messiah, was always meant as a promise to all people. And in fact, when we are going to talk about the Magi in a few moments, the wise men who came from the east to worship him, we see again a symbol of the fact that Jesus is for all nations, every tribe and tongue, and that he is a light shining in our world to banish every kind of darkness, emotional darkness, spiritual darkness, the darkness of injustice and inequity, the darkness of spiritual degradation, cruelty, warfare, disease, most of all, the darkness of death, because he brings life. He is a seed sown that brings forth fruit. He is the first fruit grown. He is the firstborn of many brethren. He is the Lord of the harvest, and his promised coming is evidence to us that God will complete the harvest that he has begun. And therefore, we celebrate, not only at Christmas, but in all seasons, we celebrate the fruitfulness of God. But especially this year, the year that the Lord has said to us here at PCF is a year of harvest. We are looking at this Christmas season as a harvest time. I did this in the, uh, in the in-person patio service this morning. I won't be able to see you, but I'm asking you to do it anyway. I mentioned how, even though this has been a challenging year in many ways, I can attest to the fact that for me personally, there really has been harvest. God has done fruitful things in my life, in this church, even in the midst of challenge. In fact, in in a certain way, the, the challenge of the times has revealed the brightness of God's goodness and the hardiness of his harvest. In the same way that that star that shined in the sky for the wise men was not a star that you could likely see during the day. It requires the night. You might wonder, why does God allow darkness in our lives? Why is there any season that is like a cycle of night? Well, it is in the hands of the Lord to understand all of those things. I can't necessarily give you an answer that will explain that to your satisfaction. But at least beware of this. At least be aware of this, that at night, the stars come out. They're always there, but you can see them in the dark. In the same way that a seed goes into the ground, and it can't be immediately fruitful because it takes time, so also in your life and mine, 
there may be times and seasons where God, I'm not saying brings the dark, but allows it in order for his light to shine all the more brightly in your life. Raise your hand if you've had harvest this year. Raise your hand if God has done something in you or through you or for you or around you that has produced a multiplied blessing. Because it's important to affirm that. As we raise our hands before the Lord, and I'm raising both of mine because I'm saying God has done that, we are lifting worship to Him. It's like incense. It smells good to Him, and it creates a handshake, if you will, in the heavens. You know that famous painting uh, uh, on the Sistine Chapel where God reaches down with a finger and up reaches Adam with his, and there's the expectation of touch. That's what you and I are doing here, touching heaven with our thanks to say you have brought forth harvest. And in that, there's a spiritual transition, a transformation where the purity of God multiplies plentifully in our life. This season, it's a good time to recognize that there is light in the dark and hope in the night. And trust on that basis. That's what harvest really calls for. It calls for a certain degree of trust. You sow the seed and then you work the field, but it's really up to God to make that seed grow. And yet when you've seen how faithful God has been to fulfill his word, to help his people, to be present in the midst of trial and to bring forth solutions, victories, help, then you know that he's worthy of our trust and you know that he's the only one that can guide us by his light. He leads us by his word even when we don't know where we're going. We may not know exactly where we're going, but like those wise men following the star, if we follow the scriptures and if we follow the leading of the spirit, we will know who we are following and we will trust that he's the one to guide us because his pathway is one of a good future and good hope. I know the plans I have for you, said the Lord through the prophet Jeremiah, even as Pastor uh, Edwin Bernardino preached to us a few weeks back. And those plans are good. They are to give you a future and a hope. I'm excited for the 20s, for the 2020s. I am. If Jesus tarries and allows me to stay here on earth through this decade, I believe there's great harvest on going ahead. I think there are challenges that lay before us that may be among the greatest challenges this world has ever known. But at the same time, I am also confident that in the midst of those challenges, in the midst of any hardship, there is harvest in the Lord. In the midst of any darkness, God's light still shines. And I'm excited for the purposefulness of God to be worked out through you and I, Mangan Kapatid, in this decade ahead of the 20s. In this decade of opportunity and possibility if we will set ourselves to worship the Lord and to focus on his purpose and to be a witness for his reality in our world, he will keep us on a pathway of hope and he will guide us by his light. In fact, the promise of light is integral to the Christmas promise from the beginning. We've been looking at Isaiah chapter 9 in these weeks. Will you look at it with me again? The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And what God is saying there is, there's a productive promise that I have planted among you, and I am going to multiply it plentifully, and it's pure product will be a cause for rejoicing in the same way that people rejoice at the fruitfulness of the harvest. And here is the sign to you, and here is the seed for you, and here is your salvation. A child will be born to you. A son will be given to you, and the government will be on his shoulders. He'll be a wonderful counselor. He'll be the mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. In the first week of Advent, we talked about how this productive promise of God is a light rising on the horizon of our lives. As soon as we turn to focus on the Lord, we'll see there is a light dawning for us in the same way that the wise men saw the star suddenly arise in the heavens. And it proclaims something. It's not just light. It's light with a source. It's a seed with a purpose. And the purpose is that you and I would know the rule of the Prince of Peace. He comes to save us. The star that rises shines on Jesus. And 
even though when the wise men come to him, he's just a little baby, even though the star that they see in the sky is just a little light, the way starlight is, it's like just a little seed. It goes down into the earth and produces great results. And that puts patience into our hearts. When you know that there's hope ahead, you can hold on. Well, there's hope ahead. So hold on. Don't give up. Don't, don't give up on God. Don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on this world. There is a productive promise of God. And God would not have saved the world if he did not intend to redeem it and make good use of it. In fact, what we are told is that the rulership of God will never end. And this is specifically the Messiah's reign. The greatness of Jesus' government and the totality of his peace will never have an end. It constantly expands. It produces more. That light that has risen in our lives, it needs to rule over our lives. His reign needs to rule over us. How can we make that really happen? First of all, I surrender all. I surrender all, all to Jesus. I surrender, I surrender all. Is Jesus Lord of your life? Have you surrendered every decision to him? All that you have, all that you own, your marriage or lack of marriage, your children, or lack of children, your parents, or lack of parents, your work, your career, your vision, your dreams, your lack of work, your lack of a career, your lack of vision, your lack of dreams, has it all been given over to him? Come to him and give to him in prayer, in worship, everything you have and everything you are. You know what we begin to discover when we do that, we come first asking for all the things that we want, and God says, ask, ask away. But God leads us into a deeper place. You start to realize that there's more to him than you realized, than you saw. And there's more to you. You may get to the place where you think, I don't even know how to surrender or what to surrender. And that's actually a good place, friends. I think it's a place where the heart of worship really begins to blossom. You come to him not knowing, not understanding. And that's seeking. I'm looking for you, Lord. Help me understand you. Help me know your character, your ways. Help me to, to read your word and want to read your word and understand your word. Help me to share. You know, I read something this week that talked about how learning really consists of a 50-50 arrangement 50% of it, and I'm sure this isn't scientific, but it's, you'll get the point of it. Half of learning has to do with the pouring in of information, with the exposure to ideas and concepts. But the other half of it is you then synthesizing that and applying it. In other words, you've got to actually put it to use. You know how you'll learn something best? I, I've learned this as an educator myself. If you really want to learn a subject, teach it. Now, don't teach it before you learn it, but recognize that when you have to actually give an explanation to someone else, or when you have to show how something operates or explain the background of something to someone else, when you have to put it into your own words, when you have to draw the diagrams, when you have to make the, the, the concepts clear, you'll be forced to come to a deeper understanding of it, and you will also begin to apply it in your life in ways that you didn't do before. I think this is part of why God actually wants us as believers to be his witnesses, because it is really in witnessing to others that we come to a deeper place of faith within ourselves. And if you're going to be a faithful witness, and if you're going to be a good teacher, you also have to re realize and acknowledge that you don't have all the answers, and you don't understand any, everything. But you can also um, enjoy the, the experience of learning more as you share and teach. Ask, seek, and knock for God. Expect him to answer. If you ask expecting an answer, you will get an answer. If you seek God with all your heart, you will find him. 
If you expect God to be true to his word, you will not be disappointed. But actually what will happen is God's word will multiply in you. And out of your own experience, there will come an increasing harvest of God's promise. That's because the rule of God produces fruitfulness in our lives. It produces good decisions, good choices, and good preparation for when you make the bad decision or make a mistake or someone else pushes you off the track, then God is there to get you back on. When the Magi came and brought gold to baby Jesus, they were acknowledging you are a king because gold belongs to kings. It came from kings and it was being given to a king. They were acknowledging the beauty of his royal rule. They were acknowledging also the purity because gold is pure. It is elemental. It's on that periodic table of elements. It's strong. And not only does it fill the treasure house of the king, and not only is it plated on the armament and the, and the decor of the king, but it is also part and parcel of the worship environment of the Lord. When God decreed how the tabernacle and the temple was to be made, he decreed that there was to be gold all over the place, all kinds of gold decor and gold implements and instruments. In fact, the Ark of the Covenant was golden, and there was gold plating and even pure gold sculpture all throughout the tabernacle and the temple, which declares not only the royalty of God, but also the purity of his worship. Now, remember that when that tabernacle was made initially, they were in the wilderness, the people of ancient Israel. Talk about people walking in darkness, and yet they were following a light. The presence of the Lord was a pillar of flame, right, at, at nighttime in the dark, and a cloud, a pillar of cloud, like the incense cloud coming up from the altar. In fact, you can see the Magi mission in the tabernacle. There you see the light in the dark that is the star. There you see the gold right, in the temple. There you see the incense cloud of worship. And next week we will talk more about myrrh and its bitterness because that also is there in the sacrificial system of the temple. But in any case, what we um, acknowledged last week was that we give to God because he has given to us. When God gave his people this beautiful pattern of worship that is the tabernacle, he said, now call the people to bring in their gold and bring in their jewels because it's out of that that the tabernacle and the temple is going to be made. It's not that God can't produce gold. God made gold and, and God made everything. It's that it's an act of worship when we give our gold to God. It acknowledges he's our king. And as we give materially to this church, you are giving to God your trust and your worship or to uh, any kind of ministry or uh, uh, help to someone in need that you give in the name of God, you are giving your gold to your sovereign ruler and you can be sure that as you invest in his kingdom, his harvest returns to you plentifully. So in that way, through our giving, we are trusting and we are also anticipating that God will reward those who diligently seek him because he is a righteous ruler. And his reign goes on. It extends into arenas where there is injustice to bring justice, where there is unrighteousness, he will bring righteousness now and forever. This combination that we find in Isaiah of, of uh, justice and righteousness, it's, it's evident in all of Jesus' earthly teaching. When he grew up and went around the countryside teaching about God, he taught people that the righteousness of God could not be ignored, could not be denied, and also that the righteousness of God would come to those who hungered and thirsted for it. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for it, Jesus uh, preaches on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, because they will be filled if you hunger and thirst for the harvest of God, you'll find that harvest is productive and plentiful and pure. Jesus, when he was speaking to the Samaritan woman about right worship, said that what God is looking for is worshipers who will worship him, not necessarily based on where they worship or just the, you know, the, 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 the gross um, uh, rule of how you do it and what you say and when you say it, but the attitude in the heart 
is where all of that is supposed to come from. In other words, if you're just following legalistic religious rituals, but you haven't the heart and the spirit of it, those rituals are meaningless. In fact, they even turn offensive to God. Uh, the Lord makes that clear elsewhere in Scripture. But if those, if those activities are informed by the Spirit, well, it's like what we said earlier about all the accoutrement of Christmas. On its own, it does not convey Christmas, and it, 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 it can go away. Decorations and decor, ritual and tradition can be swept away. But if in your heart the Spirit of the Lord lives and rules, He will reign, and there's no end to that. Then all those activities and rituals and traditions will be informed by that and filled by it, like, like the temple being filled with the incense. Because God seeks those who would worship him in spirit and in truth. The light of God reigns. Reigns in the sense of a ruler who is in charge, orchestrating and managing a kingdom. But I want to play on the other uh, homonym meaning of reign in the English language that it filters down and falls all over us. Remember also Isaiah 55, when God says, my word doesn't return to me void. It's, it's like snow and rain on the mountains that comes down into the valleys so that the seed of my word, when it's planted, is productive and plentiful and fulfills its purpose, the purity of the word of God, fulfilling purely its purpose. And his purpose is righteousness. So God will reign. He will order and organize your life when you let him to rule, when you surrender all to him. And what he will do is provide you with righteousness. Now, the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. But when the light of God reigns over you, the justice and righteousness of God that he has made you to hunger for will be filled up like a well being filled when it rains. The Magi recognized all of these things. I want to pivot at this point and with the remainder of the message, talk about the, the mission and the message of the Magi's gifts relative to these Advent expectations. The Magi's mission, their, their effort to come from the East, find this promised Messiah, and worship him in real ways with practical um, uh, demonstration of their trust and faith, it conveys a message of fruitful invitation and multiplication. In other words, they're not coming on their own accord. They're coming because they've been invited. They came to know the scriptures through the people of God, and they believe that God has an invitation to them. And they're right, and that invitation extends to you too today. By the way, friend, if you're watching this and you've been wandering away from the Lord or you've never walked with the Lord, maybe you've never surrendered all, here's an invitation to you today. Come to me, says the Lord and I will make you fruitful, and I will multiply that fruitfulness. It reveals the Magi's mission, how productive the word of God's call is, and how that potentiates a plentiful harvest, which also creates a witness. These men that came from the East, they came to the very people that were Jesus' own, as it were, to borrow the phrasing of John chapter 1. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But to as many as did receive him, he gave them the right to become children of God, servants of the king, and members of the family. So these magi, they came and they said, we've come to worship your Messiah. And actually the people in Jerusalem, where they first arrived in the capital, were all abuzz because of this. They hadn't been looking at the star, apparently. They hadn't been waiting eagerly. But these outsiders had been brought in by God, and they became a witness, even to God's own people, and even to us today. 2,000 years later, I don't know their names or how many of them there were. I know there's traditions about that, but they're not scripturally based. It's not necessarily even important. What we know is how they worshipped and who they worshipped. They worshiped the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace, and their worship is a witness to you and I today. The gifts they gave and how they came and how they worshiped. They were following the light of the Lord by his word and by his spirit, and it led them, he led them, into pure and righteous worship. Let's review quickly for any who might be joining us and haven't been part of the study so far in this series, or just if you need a little refresher, who are these Magi men? So these were a priestly class of scholarly advisors to Eastern kings. They really came up in the Mesopotamian tradition, but they were also typical of ancient Near Eastern 
um, royal courts. I mean, you can find e e essentially the same kind of uh, class of uh, scholars and priests in the e Egyptian style and so forth um, in Assyria, in Babylonia, in the Persian Empire. Magi reflects that Persian tradition, and in all likelihood, these uh, men were from the Persian uh, royal system. They weren't themselves kings, in, it, not probably, but they represented kings. So they did come as a royal entourage. And in that, we see that, as I mentioned, outsiders are being invited in because the promise of God, which came through Israel, was always intended for all people, to Israel first and to all people. So there's an invitation to Gentiles, to outsiders. You and I should think about that in this Christmas season, how the Magi, real wisdom, is revealed by inviting in people who don't expect you to invite them in, by reaching out to people who don't expect your outreach, by giving in ways and at times that people don't expect, or even if they do expect, by doing it in the name of the Lord and as unto the Lord, you are walking in the way of wisdom that the wise men of old walked in as well. The invitation to the Gentiles is revealed in their mission, and so is the adoration of kings. Because, like I said, though they were probably not kings themselves, they came with the king's wealth. They came with gold and with these fine, fragrant uh, elements of frankincense and myrrh that were expensive commodities. They came at the expense of the kingdom, making their travel. They came officially representing their court to Herod in Jerusalem, and more importantly, really for our purposes, to Jesus Christ in Bethlehem. They came to show that though they had authority, their authority was subservient and submitted to the Christ. Now, as I've said, in their giving... And in their worship, there is a message that you and I can see in that. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 2 where we find their story. We've already talked about how the star is what guided them. And in that, there is revealed a reality about the scriptures. They would not have even been looking for the star of Bethlehem in the heavens if they hadn't first heard about it in the scriptures. They had been exposed to the scriptures probably during the Babylonian exile. And in the scriptures, as we looked at a couple of weeks ago, in the book of Numbers, there's a prophecy about a star that rises, that reveals the birth of a king. So then, they knew that the Lord was real, they believed his word, and they actually acted in a way in which their lives were being shaped by that belief. They, they acted on what they believed. They put their money where their mouth was by bringing these gifts. And they put the rubber to the road by traveling the distance they, they, that they did at some expense with some risk. In this, we see in the star, the scriptures revealed as God's doctrinal guidance in our lives, a, a, an objective um, guidance for you and I that if we will look to it daily, will help uh, lead our path in the natural world. God is interested in natural things. God is interested in the day in and day out details of your bank account and of your physical health. He's interested in your workplace, your job assignments, your, your school assignments. He's, he is, people sometimes think, oh, I don't want to bother God with those things or God doesn't care about those things. But God cares intimately about those things because he cares about you and because he is able to see everything that's going on in the world and recognizes what's important. If something is important to you, it's important to him. And he will operate in the natural world. He will produce things for you that are helpful. He will help guide you and he will help lead you in natural ways, but also in supernatural ones. Because even though the star in the heavens was seen with um, astronomical precision, these men were highly trained in the movement of stars and planets and so forth, and they knew how to look in the natural heavens for this natural sign, we also see that when the light shined on the house in Bethlehem, there's a supernatural element of this star, because that's not something that you can determine just through the triangulation of an astronomical feature. There has to be a supernatural guidance. Later, when they are to return home, they hear from the Lord in a dream, in a supernatural fashion. Don't go back the way of Herod. Herod is lying. Herod's up to no good. Go a different way. Will you say that? Go a different way. Living according to the supernatural guidance of God is a different way from the way of the world, but it is the way of the word. And yet it doesn't come in contradiction to his word ever, and it isn't meant 
to take us out of the natural world. It is to help us to understand God's activity in both. Like that incense rising from the altar, it's a handshake place between the supernatural guidance of God and the natural assistance of the Lord in our lives to lead us in his wise ways. When they finally arrive, they rejoice, they fall to the ground and surrender all. They surrender their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Let's talk about this, this worship of the Magi as we come to our conclusion. There's a purity of heart and purpose that you and I can see in it that delights the Lord. And it, yet it, that comes not, not just because these were great guys, but because they were people who had given themselves to God. They had given themselves to the study of his word and seeking its application in their natural world and yielding to his supernatural guidance. And that's where the heart of worship was purified by God in them. And they put it into practice. They, they give gifts that reflect God. In two ways, I want to talk about how these gifts reflect God. One is, you'll notice there's three gifts. This is what's given rise to the idea that there were three wise men. There were probably a lot more than that because a caravan of this nature would have been a larger company. But uh, the, the three is indicative of the gifts that were given, and it matters. I wrote a post about this in the devotions this past week. The Trinity of Gifts reveals the Trinity of our God. There's only one God, one Lord God over all Israel, over all the earth, over all creation. There is one creator of us all. But that one God is in three persons. The mystery of the Trinity goes beyond what you and I can understand, even as the mystery of the Incarnation goes beyond what you and I can understand. In other words, how is it that a virgin was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and conceived the Christ, who is himself God and yet is also fully human? Can you understand that? It goes beyond what you and I can understand, but not beyond what we can believe. So also, this one God is Father, is Son, our Savior, and is Holy Spirit. And that goes beyond what I can understand, but not beyond what I can believe. And there is a beautiful uh, revelation about the reality of who God is and how he operates in our lives in the Trinity. Now, the Magi's gift reveals that Trinity symbolically. I mentioned that gold uh, last week, and we talked about it a little bit earlier today, is associated with kings, with wealth, with strength, with purity, with worship. In all these ways, the gold is a gift that, that refers to the one who made gold and made all beautiful things in the world and makes all things beautiful. Father God, the creator, who rules eternally and reigns eternally. And he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and all the treasuries of heaven. And everything bright and beautiful that is truly bright and beautiful is really just a reflection of him. Gold represents Father God. The frankincense, incense that wafts up to heaven, that can be compressed into an oil as it's processed. It actually is a plant product. Uh, and so again, it reflects the creation of the natural world by the creator. But in the refining of that plant product, it was made to be used in worship. In fact, if you look at uh, Exodus, I believe it's chapter uh, 30, I may be uh, misremembering my reference there, but in the book of Exodus, you get guidance from the Lord on what the co uh, composition is to be of the incense that is to be burned uh, in the tabernacle and temple worship. And included in there are these spices, these uh, plant resin products that we see being given to, to Jesus, frankincense and myrrh. They're involved in the creation of that fine, fragrant worship element of incense. And as I mentioned, frankincense also could be produced into an oil that was used as the oil of anointing, the official anointing oil for kings and priests in ancient Israel. And of course, that anointing is precisely what we are talking about when we are talking about the Messiah, when we are talking about Christ. Words that are just two different languages for the same thing, anointed. Christ and Messiah mean anointed. It means that God has chosen this one and God's spirit is upon this one and God will strengthen this one and this one is pure in the purity of God. The oil of frankincense that is upon uh, the, the king is also upon the priest. Jesus is both king and priest. But the oil represents the Holy Spirit, the purity of God in his, his capacity to cleanse, to heal, to fuel, to fire, to power. So in the gift of frankincense, 
we see the Holy Spirit. And finally, myrrh, which means bitter. And as I mentioned, is a plant product, comes from a thorny tree, maybe the very tree that, that was used to create the crown of thorns that the Roman soldiers placed mockingly upon Jesus. They were mocking him as king, but he is king. And while he is a prince of peace, they were not showing peace to him, but God's peace was still within him. And yet it was a bitter price that he had to pay going to the cross. The tree that gives rise to myrrh, that thorny tree, is in itself a symbol of the tree of Christ, the cross of Christ, which he went to faithfully. Myrrh was also used in the incense offering and, in fact, as a perfume. We'll talk more about it next week. It was a perfume of passion. It shows up in the Song of Songs, worn um, as, a, a, as a fragrant way for one lover to greet another and to show uh, her love for her husband. So there is both Beauty and sweetness, and bitterness and sorrow described in myrrh. And there is a mission, a mission to the cross, the tree of Christ. In, it was also used in balming. There's a mission that goes to the grave, and yet even within the grave, the sweet smell of Christ's passion, his love for his church, his bride, is still rising, even as Jesus Christ himself rises. The Holy Spirit is seen, excuse me, the Son of God is seen in the gift of myrrh, the Savior who went to the cross. Gold for the Father, incense for the Spirit, the bitter myrrh for the sacrifice of the Son. Each of these are seen in the gifts. And yet the gifts are given to the Son. And so Jesus Christ himself is also seen in his roles in the gift. Jesus, who was called to be and equipped to be priest, prophet, and king, the gold of the king, which demonstrates the reverence for his rulership in their life, his divine office as prophet, which is reflected in the prophetic message of the myrrh, which shows what lies ahead and the hardship that he will suffer for his people. And, of course, the commitment of consecration that is seen in the incense offering that is for the priest and by the priest. So Jesus is acknowledged as our great high priest, the high priest of the Holy Spirit who worships God in spirit and in truth and who grants his spirit to us. In fact, Jesus is the one who baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. And we see that in this gift of frankincense. We see it in our act of worship. So as we conclude today, I want to give some thoughts about our Christmas harvest hope as we lift the incense of worship to the Lord. The Holy Spirit is what's being focused on in this gift. And may I ask that you and I would focus on the Holy Spirit and on his purity in the week ahead as we prepare to celebrate Christmas, as we prepare to experience a harvest, a harvest in our own lives, in our own soul, in our own worship. There's purity. How pure is your life? Or maybe I could ask it this way. How impure is your life? is your home, is your heart. I've got impurity in mine. I confess that to you. There are things in me that are not worthy of the call of the Lord on me. Ways that I can think. If I give in to doubt, if I give in to depression, if I uh, seek to protect myself, and do harm to others. If I'm less than honest, if I yield to temptation, even in my mind, harboring lust, greed, anger, unforgiveness, resentment, that's impurity. Well, friends, I have that. I deal with that. I struggle with that. But I take that to the Lord and surrender it to him. And what Jesus has is purity. Where I'm unforgiving, he gives forgiveness. Not only to me, but he enables me to forgive others. Where I'm selfish, he brings selflessness. Where I'm lusting or tempted to lie, he brings truth and holiness. Where I'm angry or tempted to be harmful or hurtful, he gives me patience and grace. 
And when I fail in that, he gives me the courage and integrity to ask for forgiveness, or at least he will if I will give that over to him. And it becomes an act of worship of God to say you're sorry to someone that you've harmed, to ask forgiveness from someone, to grant forgiveness to someone, to give help to someone who has no reasonable expectation of it from you, to give hope to someone when you could just walk right on, but you want to give them hope, not only to help them, but to worship the Lord. That is purity. Do you want purity? God promises it to you, and his promise is productive, and it will multiply plentifully. It will produce purity in you by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one who grants us the Holy Spirit. That's what it means when we say that he baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. Let the Lord baptize you in his Holy Spirit. Ask for that. Ask for the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Ask for the purity of worship. Ask for hope in the night, light in the dark, guidance for your path. Open his word. Open your heart to him. Let his spirit speak to you. God will produce the harvest of faith and he will lead you not only in worship and in witness, but into the pure place of uttermost joy. Lord, we turn our lives to you today. If there's anyone joining with me in this prayer, Lord, and they recognize that impurity has had a hold on them, uh, they recognize that they've been turned away from you, or maybe even recognizing that they've never turned towards you. I pray, Lord, that right now, by the purity of your Holy Spirit, you would reach them, touch them, teach them, fill them, cleanse them, release them, and draw them into you, Lord, and us, all of us, even those of us, Lord, who would say, we've not turned away from you and we are following you, and yet we stumble, Lord, and we acknowledge that we stumble, and yet we find it hard, Lord, and we acknowledge that we find it hard, and we, we lose hope, and we lose sight, and we, we get off the path, and we stray, but Lord, thank you for your forgiveness, Thank you for your acceptance and thank you for your pure spirit filling me today, filling us today. Let us be, Lord, your witnesses to this world in need. Let us be your light in the dark. You've said that we are the light of the world only because you came and lit us up with you. Light us up again with you today, Lord God, that we may worship you and witness to the world the reality that Christ who has come is coming again and that you are King of Kings the Prince of Peace, and the light of the world. Hallelujah and amen.